The intelligence community is sounding the alarm that the effects of climate change will worsen risks to national security. But the IC must pivot resources and capabilities to respond effectively to those new threats. That's according to Rolf Moat Larsen. He's a 23-year veteran of the CIA and led the Department of Energy's Intelligence Unit from 2005 to 2008. He's currently a senior fellow at the Belfer Center. Rolf, welcome to the program. Pleased to be here. Thank you. Can you outline for us what the threats to national security would look like as a result of climate change? One of the things that's good about making this pivot you you de you described is that we do know a lot about the threats that are coming at us because they're happening as we speak. They're unfolding in the world around us. The question is which ones affect national and global security and then what should the intelligence and defense community, the national security community in the United States and, uh, and around the world do about it? And there are threats like water scarcity, energy and, and environmental competition, uh, regional conflicts that are spawned by people that are displaced, increased waves of refugee crises, which we've already seen. And we're already seeing all of these things, infectious diseases, pandemics, and rise in, in, in those. So those are some of the big problems we face. There was a report that was recently issued by the Office of the Director of National Intelligence that said that the threats to U.S. national security interests will increase as a result of climate change. Do you think that's not enough? It's a start. And, and you have to know what you're trying to do or what the problem is uh, before you can decide how to make that pivot of, of capability resources. And I would also say culture uh, and thinking about the problem. And so, yeah, it's a good start. What, what the intelligence community now has to do, led by the director of national intelligence, is decide how they can give President Biden and this administration and then future administrations better, what we call a decision advantage in intelligence. How can they make better climate policies and how can we to undertake action that'll mitigate some of these problems? That's the essential challenge to make that ch that pivot. Well, aside from the uh, shift in mindset, talk about the shift in resources that you'd like to see in the intelligence community that would address these threats. The, the big challenge always when you're confronting an unprecedented new challenge is how do you organize to do it? So what's the organizational units that are created? And, and do you do that before you know what you're trying to do or decide what you're going to do and then create the organization? So I would, I would submit that the intelligence community needs to first think through what it thinks it needs to do and then create an organization that's tailor-made to do those things, including working with our foreign partners, recruiting new kinds of sources, and, and other things that the intelligence community has traditionally done with its capabilities. Well, one thing is that the CIA director, Bill Burns, has announced that he's establishing the Transnational and Technology Mission Center. And he says that the focus will be on lots of issues, but one of them is climate change and global health. Do you think that's a step in the right direction? Is it enough for CIA? Right. Right. It's certainly not enough. That's, uh, I think the challenge is going to be uh, taking these ideas and then and, and actualizing them. So in, in that case, I think it's a great initiative. It's a good start again. But the question is, what what kind of people will that organization need? Uh, obviously, they're not counter-terrorist people that are hunting terrorists with drones and things. They're not classic espionage types. So what's the kind of culture you want to create? How do you work with other agencies? For example, you mentioned I worked in Department of Energy. I would submit the Department of Energy is one of the leading players. And how will this new unit in the CIA cooperate with the Department of Energy, intelligence, and the laboratories who have phenomenal knowledge and not replicate capabilities that already exist in the U.S. government. What do you think about the intelligence tools, right? So collection, analysis, dissemination, how do you better align that to deal with the effects of climate change? That's the most exciting question you can ask me because I, the old intelligence cycle, we call it, uh, priorities, collection, intelligence, analysis, and then uh, dissemination. That's what we do, whether it's climate change or espionage or, or, or understanding what our rivals are doing. That's what we did in the Cold War. We can still do that in the age of climate change. Now, the questions now are, how do we apply those basic tools? Should they be done in secret? Do we need spies doing this? Do we compete with countries or do we cooperate with countries? Do we do it unilaterally or do we do it multilaterally? And, and I think there are exciting questions to reimagine the role of intelligence in the 21st century. And the most fundamental question, perhaps the most important thing I can say on your show today, is we have a fundamental decision to, decide, to make as to whether we compete in the intelligence world as we've traditionally done 
or cooperate. Because whether it's Russia, China, Iran, countries we consider rivals today, if not adversaries, we need to cooperate on climate change. And we need to apply at least part of the things we did against one another to work with one another, say in the Arctic with the Russians or in the Far East with the Chinese. I did want to ask you a little bit more about that, especially with international allies. What needs to be done in that arena? Because, you know, if we're talking about more collaboration, that means more transparency. And you know the intelligence yes. uh, community does not like transparency. You're right. And there are many people in the intelligence world that are very skeptical that we should be doing this. And, and uh, I'm a very, very harsh on that, that thinking because that mindset is, is problematic for us. We need to first decide whether, for example, we wanted to create mistrust by spying on one another to know if we're complying with the terms of the Paris Accord or we're going to sow mistrust by taking this new challenge and do what we did in the Cold War or whether we're going to start with transparency open, open and not also fall into the defeat, default position that all, all intelligence must be done in secret and needs secrecy and it doesn't. And that's the exciting part. The mindset needs to change and then the culture of how we do this needs to adapt to this problem. I'll just draw one more example. In after World War II, Robert Oppenheimer, the, the father of the US atomic bomb, approached uh, Harry Truman, the president at the time, and suggested that we find a way to cooperate with states to not get into this trillion dollar, what turned out to be a nuclear arms race that was sheer folly because we can never use these weapons. Now, I wouldn't say this is as dramatic as that, period in, in world history, but we are there where the leaders of the world need to set the tone of how we cooperate. All right. Well, Ralph, thanks so much. We'll watch and see if that mind shift actually happens. Thanks for being Thank on the program. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.